Hello, and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. My name is Mara Lepaluoto, and I am a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of the indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community, in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today's service is led by our interim minister, Reverend Dr. Teresa Cooley, gratefully easing back following her knee surgery, and music by yeah. <laughs> and music by Dr. Zaneda Robles, Wells Lang, and Carla Jamie Perez. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over, over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Based on guidance from our COVID safety team, masks are recommended, though optional, for congregants inside and are optional outside. Families with young children are welcome in the sanctuary, the narthex, or in our new family lounge in the living room of the neighborhood house, where the service is live streamed on a big screen. The lounge is staffed by a host to help you feel at home. There are many signups and, and inf at the information tables on the patio today after service. It's covered under the tents. And due to the rain, today's Octavia Butler walking tour will be rescheduled. This Friday, December 16th, gather family and friends for a concert by our own amazing musical staff to benefit their upcoming trip to Carnegie Hall. It's gonna be great, you guys. Next Sunday evening, December 18th, join us for a Hanukkah party in Neighborhood House, complete with food, games, and traditions. Great for all ages, for those who are Jewish, Jewish, and you, you, you use curious about this tradition. Our youth present our Christmas pageant next Sunday. Christmas Eve services will be at 5.30 and 8 p.m., and there will be no services on Christmas Day or New Year's Day. Our order of service and more extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email posted in the narthex or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
So great to be back among you. Being away just serves to remind me what a wonderful community this is. So let's warm up the space a little bit and say good morning to one another. You can get up, you can raise. Doesn't that make you feel warmer? All right. Great to be with one another. To worship is to attend to that which is most worthy. To worship is to lay down our daily mundane concerns and connect with what brings greater meaning and purpose to our lives. To worship is to let down our defenses and allow ourselves to feel the joy that comes from the soaring song and the friendly face. To worship is to lay bare, even for just a moment, a profound sorrow that may weigh us down and feel the lighter for it. To worship is to know that there are far greater things in the universe that we can but dimly comprehend. To worship is to feel that we ourselves are worthy in all our various identities and experiences to know that we are not alone. To worship is to attend to that which is most worthy. Come, let us worship together. Our opening hymn is number 89. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our opening hymn, Come My Way, My Truth, My Life. Oh, Lord, 
Good morning. Good morning. I'm the Director of Religious Education, Matt Vasco, and I would like to welcome all of our children and youth up to the front for a story for all ages, please. Good to see you all this morning. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Maybe you'll enjoy our story. So our story this morning, well, a little, a little background. Um, you may have seen that Teresa's sermon theme today is about um, what Jesus means to her. And when she told me that was what she was going to be preaching about today, this book immediately came to mind for me because this is a, a, a Skinner House book, a Unitarian Universalist book, written by Lynn Tuttle Gunny. And she actually dedicates it to her children because she wanted to teach them a little bit about the faith she grew up in. So, uh, like many of us, I think, or some of us at least, uh, I grew up in a Christian tradition and found Unitarian Universalism as an adult. And so I really connect with this book because it's called Meet Jesus, The Life and Lessons of a Beloved Teacher. And you'll see it's a really wonderful story about the human Jesus and the lessons that he taught. This is the story of Jesus, a beloved teacher. Although he lived long ago, his lessons of love and kindness still bring hope and joy to people all over the world. Jesus was born more than 2,000 years ago in a land now called Israel. He grew up in the town of Nazareth with his brothers and sisters and their parents, Mary and Joseph. Joseph was a carpenter, and he taught Jesus how to shape rough wooden logs into sturdy beams for building homes. He showed Jesus how to make plows and shovels that were straight and strong. And he helped Jesus craft tables and chairs and cups and bowls that were both beautiful and useful. Joseph and Mary raised Jesus in the traditions of the Jewish faith. Jesus learned to read the Torah a sacred book that, Jesus, that Jewish people believe was inspired by God. As Jesus and Joseph worked side by side in the carpentry shop, they talked about religion. Jesus felt a strong connection to God. He began to sense that God had called him to bring people a new message of love and forgiveness. Every year, Jesus' family celebrated the Jewish tradition of Passover in the city of Jerusalem, the center of Jewish life. Jesus loved to sit among the teachers in the great temple, listening to their lively conversations. He was very curious and asked many questions. The teachers were amazed by how much he understood. When he grew up, Jesus began to travel the countryside and tell people his ideas about living together in peace and harmony. Soon, crowds gathered to hear him pe preach. People would bring 
sometimes sick relatives or friends, and Jesus helped them feel better. News of Jesus as a healer and a teacher spread. Jesus did not do this work alone. A group of men and women traveled with him. He chose 12 friends called disciples to help him teach his ideas to others. Come, follow me, he said to the disciples. Together they walked from village to village, sharing their new ideas with anyone who wanted to listen. Jesus said we should love one another because God loves us. God loves each one of us, even when we make mistakes or do wrong. This idea of God surprised some people. Jesus often told stories or parables to teach people about God. One day he told this parable. Once there was a shepherd who looked after a flock of 100 sheep. When the shepherd noticed that one little lamb was missing, he was very upset. Leaving the flock, the shepherd searched high and low from dawn to dusk. When he finally found his lost lamb, he was filled with joy. The parable helped Jesus explain how God loves and cares for each of us, just like the shepherd loves and cares for each one of his sheep. Mothers and fathers brought their sons and daughters to meet Jesus. At first, the disciples waved the children away, worried that they would bother Jesus. But Jesus gathered the children around them, him and blessed them. Let the children come to me, he said. Jesus believed we should love one another, even people who aren't our friends. Treat everyone like you would like to be treated, he taught. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Someone asked, but who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered with another parable. Once upon a time, there was a Jewish man who was attacked by robbers while on a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. The traveler walked by and saw the man, a traveler walked by and saw the man lying injured by the side of the road, but didn't stop to help him. Another traveler came along and did not stop either. Then a Samaritan walked by. The Samaritan could see that the injured man was a Jew. Even though Samaritans and Jews had different religious beliefs and often did not get along, the traveler stopped to help. The Samaritan cleaned and bandaged the injured man's wounds and then helped him onto his donkey, took him to an inn, and paid for him to stay until the man was well enough to travel again. As the crowd listened, Jesus told them, go and care for one another like the Good Samaritan did. We are all neighbors. We can show love for others by taking care of all people who need help. Jesus taught his followers to look for ways to live in harmony, learn to forgive, and to settle arguments in a peaceful way. Blessed are those who work to bring peace to the world, he said, for they are the children of God. One of his disciples asked, What if someone treats me badly? How many times should I forgive? Seven times? Jesus answered, No, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. Jesus meant that we should always forgive one another, just as God has forgiven us. As he went from village to village, Jesus reached out to help sick people get well and feed those who were hungry. He treated everyone with the same kindness, men and women, Jews and non-Jews, rich and poor, good and bad. By now, Jesus had many followers. Not everyone was happy about it. The leaders in Jerusalem noticed the big crowds that gathered whenever Jesus spoke. They wondered if people might stop following their rules. Once the disciples knew that the leaders disapproved of Jesus, they were worried. 
When they gathered for their Passover meal that year, Jesus blessed the bread and wine and gave thanks to God. May peace be with you, he said to his disciples. Jesus asked them to remember him and his lessons no matter what happened. Today, this meal is known as the Last Supper. Some people share bread and wine in church as a way to remember it. After the Last Supper, things happened very quickly. Soldiers arrested Jesus, saying he was stirring up trouble. In those days, the worst criminals were punished by nailing the person to a wooden cross and leaving them to die. Jesus was punished in this terrible way. As Jesus suffered on the cross, his mother Mary and his friends gathered by his side. They knew Jesus had done nothing wrong. They were filled with sadness. After Jesus died, his followers carried on his teachings and honored his memory. Jesus' message of love and kindness spread throughout the world. Now, 2,000 years later, we can still learn from the life and lessons of Jesus. Some people say that Jesus was the Son of God. They say that after Jesus died, God resurrected him or brought him back to life. They celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday. Some people say that Jesus was a wise and beloved teacher. Whether or not he was the Son of God, that part remains true. They say it is important to remember him because he taught us to treat people with love and to stand up for justice and peace. No one knows for sure the day that Jesus was born, but many people celebrate his birthday on Christmas Day, December 25th. That's coming up, right? This is a day of joy and generosity spent with family and friends, sharing food, singing songs, and giving gifts. We celebrate the life of Jesus by trying to live as he did, with full hearts, loving words, and kind actions. The end. Thank you for listening to my story. I hope you're inspired by the life and lessons of that beloved teacher, Jesus. And I know a few of you here are performing in our Christmas pageant next Sunday, right? Yeah. Then yeah. who's that about? Same guy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. And we'll sing you out to your youth religious education classes. <laughs> Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. If you're visiting for the first or second time, welcome. You're our guest. Please let the plate pass you by. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you're a member and wish to make a payment toward your pledge or are a non-pledging member and wish to make a gift, please make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the, at the donation box. All recipients are identified by church members. To recommend an organization, fill out the application in the social, social justice tab of the church website or ask a board member to connect you with the Share the Plate Committee. This week, our gifts go to Planned Parenthood, Pasadena, and San Gabriel Valley. 
Neighborhood Church has a long-standing relationship and friendship with our local Planned Parenthood, from partnering to teach OWL classes on the church campus, to standing together as we marched for reproductive women's and LGBTQ rights. Planned Parenthood has been a church offertory recipient many times over the years. As you watch their video, please consider once again giving generously to this friendship of shared values and devoted community work. It's not just about convenience. Sometimes it's about deep love for something you don't get to have. Every parent has the right to make that decision for themselves. So the Supreme Court today took away our fundamental right to access abortion. More than 49 years of precedent and one swoop has gone away. This is the siren song of defeat that the system wants us to believe. The idea that caring less, trying less, doing less, there's nothing you can do and there's no point in trying. This moment is inevitable and I am here to say it just is not. most likely going to be impacted by this? Black, indigenous persons of color, trans men, gender non-conforming, non-binary persons who are already marginalized by society. I mean, I think about like my daughter growing up and what this is going to do to directly affect her. For me, it's really important to help these people and, you know, providing abortion care is really important and in many ways it is saving people's lives. The members of our state assembly and our senate have made an explicit commitment to continue to protect abortion access in the state of California and expand it. Not only for Californians, but for all of those who may be coming to seek services. It's going to be a long fight. It's not one that I think anybody wants to be in. but. We're not going to go backwards. That's just not really an option. This is not the future we wanted, no. but it's the reality we have. The only way through is together. So do not give in to despair, but let this moment radicalize you. Will the ushers please come forward? Thank you for giving generously.
Our prayer today is a poem written by my friend Laura Martin, who is a United Church of Christ minister in Arlington, Virginia, in praise of Advent. Please join me in the spirit of prayer, of meditation, of reflection. This is the coming again of something that we miss profoundly. This is the coming again of something that we never fully had. Both are true, of course. This year I do not run from shadows, but I give them names. What needs to be left behind? What needs to be drawn with me into these shadows? This is no one else's journey but my own, your own, and this is all our journeys intertwined. I think of migrants crossing deserts <clears throat> then and now, their currency of hope and sand. I think of the donkey whose steps grew heavy and yet she walked. I think of the shepherds who knew on a cold night when even one sheep was missing, and they searched. I think of the way that stars appear again, not to finish a story, but to witness that it is still being told. Amen. <clears throat> Before Carla sings this next anthem, I just wanted to take a very short moment to remind you once again that the choirs are preparing a wonderful holiday concert for our, or for our community in um, support and to help raise funds for our trip to Carnegie Hall this March. We know, and, and I'm so moved in this moment, especially because of this time of year, of all of the work that I do, you know, in different spheres, in music and performance, the church work that I do, especially in this community, is among the most joyful and life-giving to me. And I'm so grateful for you, and I'm so grateful for this choir. And so I'm asking now, and there's so many things to give toward, and we're so grateful for your generosity. Please consider um, taking one of these flyers. I have made a few, and I will be distributing them here and there. There'll be some on the piano, but I want to encourage you to go ahead and please support us. If you can't come to the concert next Friday, please consider giving a gift. And we're again, we want to send these folks, our brightest and best, all of them, to Carnegie Hall to represent us and take our message of love and light and justice out into the world through our historic performance at Carnegie Hall. So thank you so much for your generosity and um, Brightest and best next Friday. I'd like to send this out today to all of the people who are struggling with health issues during the holidays, people who are in life and death struggles. Domine Deus, Rex Celestis, Deus Pater, Deus Pater Omnipotens.
Around this time of year, I often get asked this question. Why do so many Unitarian Universalists come to church at Christmas? When so many Unitarian Universalist people are not necessarily Christians. And it is true. Our attendance goes up on Christmas Eve. Last year, even during the midst of the Omicron surge, those two Christmas Eve services were some of our highest attended. So there are various answers to this question, of course. Like any question that is asked of a UU, there are at least three answers, <laughs> sometimes more. We like to play the field answer-wise. Sometimes going to church on Christmas Eve is just the culturally appropriate thing to do. Hallmark demands it of us. Sometimes it's because the kids come home for the holidays and you want to show them off to your friends. Sometimes it gets us out of that difficult conversation with Uncle Joe, who always throws the most controversial thing on the table after a few too many cups of eggnog. But I believe that even for the grinchiest of Unitarian Universalists, there is almost a gravitational pull to experience the magic and the mystery of the old stories, even if we don't believe in the miracles. It is the power of ritual, the familiar elements of candles and song that provide a comfort that we didn't even know we were seeking. For me, it is a reminder of the most beautiful teachings of the Christian faith, a story that celebrates humility, common virtues, diverse people coming together around the promise and potential of new life. Yes, it could be any new life, but this story is given its significance by what we are taught of the life that became embodied in Jesus. So I sense maybe some squirming out there. It is an irony at best that one of the core principles of Unitarian Universalism is that truth can be found in all of the great religious traditions, except for some people if that teaching is from Christianity. And I know the reasons for that. I have felt the discomfort myself at times, knowing that there has been great harm that has been done in the name of Christianity. But it makes me sad when that discomfort ends up coming out as judging those who do find great meaning in the teachings of Jesus. I know there are some among you who feel dismissed or even sometimes ridiculed for your Christian faith. That's something that we all have to work on. I grew up in a small town in Texas in which the majority of people I knew were those kinds of judgmental Christians that had very rigid ideas of what that meant. I often felt their judgment and failed to see much beauty in what they espoused to me. My parents left their Lutheran upbringing and became Unitarian Universalists before I was born. So I had something to sustain me in the face of others' certitude, and there wasn't much that motivated me to delve into the depths of Christian understanding. That is, until I was accepted at Divinity School. I applied to Harvard Divinity School as it was one of the three main schools that Unitarian Universalists could go to prepare for ministry. But naively, I admit, it didn't occur to me that my education would include things that were foreign to me, like, oh, studying the Bible. I remember looking at the course catalog and requirements and going into a panic over the fact that I had never once cracked open the Bible to read it. So I sat down immediately to try to correct that deficit and began to read it from the beginning, you know, like you would any book and became lost and disheartened, especially by the time I got to all the begats and lineages in Numbers. Little did I know then that that was the worst way to read the Bible, and it's pretty much guaranteed to put you to sleep. Luckily for me, 
There were courses and professors that could open my eyes to the stories and contextualize their meaning. In seminary, I met Christians who were the opposite of dogmatic, far more learned, in fact, than the most intellectual of Unitarian Universalists. I did not emerge from this experience calling myself a Christian, but I did come away with a great respect for the body of Christian thought that deeply explores what it means to try to live a faithful life. And the Jesus that I came to know through this immersion is a Jesus that stands for most of the core values that I uphold. It's not really possible to completely divorce the person of Jesus and his life and teachings from the over 2,000 years of Christian thought and institutions, but it is possible to draw some distinctions between these. And in fact, it's been a source of fascination for many to those who want to try to uncover the historical Jesus among the scriptures and the evidence that we have. Of course, the difficulty is that there are no existent writings found right at the time of Jesus' life. Everything that we have about him is told after the fact and through a certain slant of whichever author was writing whichever version of his stories. So trying to pull out the authentic strands of Jesus' real sayings and his biography will always be a matter of speculation but the speculation continues. The most recent large effort at this speculation is what was known as the Jesus Seminars, which convened a group of diverse scholars and ministers and interested people to try to establish some kind of consensus about which biblical writings were really from the historical Jesus and which were creations of other traditions or evangelists. This group met once a year for three decades to struggle through each saying, each parable, each story. Participants delivered papers, they debated, they discussed and argued, and then they voted. And their process of voting was really interesting. Each was given four colored beads. Red meant, we're pretty sure Jesus said it. Pink meant Jesus probably said something like it. Gray means Jesus didn't necessarily say it, but it contains his ideas. And black indicates, no, Jesus really did not say that. This sounds like the kind of principle process that Unitarian Universalists would go through. I can just see it now. Everyone who comes in the door is given four colored beads. Hold up the red beads if you agree with what Teresa is saying. <laughs> Pink if you sort of agree. Gray if you disagree but not sure why. And black if you think it is horse manure. <laughs> and then afterwards you could publish the sermon with all of those sentences underlined in those colors. And this resembles a nightmare that I regularly have on <laughs> Saturday nights. And some people have been just as fearful of the results of the Jesus Seminars. Even though the scholars include very faithful Christians, many traditionalists find it blasphemous to recreate or cut up a document that many Christians believe should be accepted as a whole. If you're a traditional Christian, that reaction is understandable because the message that emerges from these seminars, the vision of this historical Jesus, radically changes what you may have thought about Jesus before. As they debate and as they talk, the red letter Jesus, the one that they think is the most authentic, was, in their language, a very vulgar man. A man who deliberately provoked and challenged all of the social, political, and religious hierarchies of the day not just through his words, but through his actions. This is a man who most resembles the Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar than he does the pietistic portrait that you often find in Christian churches. 
According to this picture of Jesus, Jesus was vulgar not to be profane, but to call people's attention to the ways in which their lives were limited, oppressed, and distant from God. When Jesus washed the feet of a prostitute, the culture of the time would have been revolted because she would have been considered the lowest of the low. But by doing so, he made an important point. He was trying to say that even those whom the culture considers the lowest of the low deserved honor along with everyone else. And perhaps it was the way that the woman was treated that was the problem. In fact, in many of the stories, Jesus showed himself to be the most feminist of men, honoring women in a way not seen in any other religious tradition. When Jesus turned over the tables in the, of the money changers in the midst of the temple, it was considered the most blasphemous of acts, disrupting a time-honored ritualized practice. But again, the extreme gesture was necessary to bring attention to the ways that religious authorities were cooperating with the economic oppression of the poor. This Jesus spoke of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, but it was not a kingdom that was far off in some other time or place. This was a kingdom that was within each person, no matter who they were. This was a kingdom that was reached not by following rules or repeating the dogma, but by living justly and allowing oneself to feel the unmediated grace of God. Jesus' message is not simple. His demands on the people of his time and the people of our time are not easy ones to live up to. I had a priest friend once say to me, is it easier to worship Jesus or to follow him? If we witness the failure of Christianity to bring about the kind of justice that Jesus urged us to create, then it becomes clear that it is a lot harder to follow him. Christian institutions are human institutions after all, and their avoidance of the radical nature of Jesus is understandable, but that doesn't mean that the message has no less validity. Christianity in its many forms may have failed to bring about the kingdom of God that Jesus urged us toward, but it has succeeded in one important achievement. Through the story of Jesus's life and death, it has spoken to a universal human condition, that of human suffering and offered a vision of hope that that suffering might be meaningful after all. One of the reasons people are attracted to Christianity is because they can see their own suffering reflected back to them and feel through the mediating image of Jesus a saving grace despite their suffering. It would be fair to ask whether Unitarian Universalist theology writ large offers the same understanding or comfort. My dear friend and colleague, Carlton Smith, has just authored a book called Try My Jesus. Carlton is an African-American and gay and grew up in both Methodist and Pentecostal traditions of the Deep South. And there he experienced the worst of what Christianity can inflict. He became a Unitarian Universalist because he could be a complete version of himself and still be welcomed in a faith home. But over time, he turned back again to the Christianity that he once loved. And he describes that process like this. Rather than arranging my whole life to become what others thought I should be, I realized that I could ground myself in who I knew I was and let others arrange themselves around me. The message became clearer with time for him. You don't have to be a prisoner to other people's beliefs about God, Jesus, heaven, or hell. You can be free. 
You don't have to be conflicted about your faith and how you live your life. You can go deeper with integrity. You don't have to feel separated from the universal love of God. You can open your heart to it so that you and everyone around you is blessed. And so he constructed this book with 365 brief reflections, beginning with gospel versions, just one page east, gospel verses, that allow him to go deeper into these questions about how to live a life of authenticity and freedom. For anyone interested in a way to encounter some wisdom that Christian scriptures can bring, I highly recommend it. So the point of this sermon is not to tell you that you have to investigate Christianity, but rather to open an invitation to something that you may have been missing due to a negative experience with it. I choose to treat, to, I choose to treat this season as an opportunity to remember these core messages of Jesus that all of us are equal, that all of us have a divine spark that lies within us, that is there regardless of what we do or who we are, that that all of us are called to dismantle kingdoms and empires and create a world in which the disadvantaged are put first. This is the wisdom the world still needs. So may this wisdom inspire us all. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 55 in the gray hymnal. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our closing hymn, Dark of Winter. Again, from Laura Martin. Walk by faith and by sight. Know you get both the unseen and all that you hold in your hands. So walk by marveling in the finite and the visible too. Walk by saying yes to the morning light however she lands at your feet. Walk by having faith in all that grows, from roots or stems or branches, or in you after you have done the hard work. Walk by memory of those who stood near when you took your first steps, and by hope for those who will touch the earth in seven generations. Walk by visions remembered and grace received. Walk by alleluia said under stars by grandparents 
who showed you how to make music. Walk by sight, which lets you keep the faith. Amen.